thanks for watching and thanks for coming. Um, this is sort of, I wasn't sure exactly what to do with the short talk, but I thought the idea was that, or at least my idea, was to present some of the things that I'm interested in doing here that I think are sort of related to some of the things that some people here might also be interested in doing. So particularly for those people here and also for people online, if any, you find any of this interesting and you want to talk about it with me, I'd be very happy to uh, talk about it. So the title is Parallel and Distributed Monte Carlo Algorithms, which is one of the things that I spent some time working on. Um, and I, this talk is very high level, you, you know, involving almost no math. Um, I'm interested in people who want to tackle potentially theoretical problems in this area, but also people who are interested in more methodological, algorithmic, computational issues as well. Okay, so just to set up the kind of problem that I'm going to be talking about, um, in Monte Carlo, one of the main things that we try and do is approximate integrals, and in particular, we often try and approximate integrals which are expectations with respect to some probability distribution. So let pi be a probability distribution, and I'm going to denote pi of f as the expectation of f of x when x is distributed according to pi. Okay, so this is kind of a ubiquitous problem in many areas of physics and statistics uh, and mathematics, numerical mathematics generally. And the, the main idea of Monte Carlo is that there's many ways to express an expectation and to approximate an expectation when you can't compute it exactly. Um, the idea of Monte Carlo or a wide range of Monte Carlo techniques is to approximate these types of expectations, integrals or sums, uh, using random variables. Okay. So for example, something that you can do is you can always simulate IID random variables from some distribution mu, compute some kind of discrepancy uh, or weight function that measures the discrepancy between your distribution pi and your distribution mu, and then um, take the average of those discrepancies multiplied by the function f at the random variables that you've observed, and in some sense, under very weak conditions on basically the support of mu with respect to pi, this type of uh, average will converge almost surely to the expectation of interest as the number of samples that you take goes to infinity. Okay. Um, so that's very basic, you know, this is like uh, 1940s. Um, but one thing that people have already pointed out, you know, in, in the context of today's computational landscape is that this is very easy to parallelize or distribute. Um, so for the context of this talk, I'd like to distinguish between parallelism and, well, di distinguish between algorithms that you can parallelize and algorithms that you can distribute. It's not a universal sort of uh, distinction, but when I say parallelize, I mean sort of on a shared memory machine with lots of cores or something, su such as a GPU or a, or a many core CPU. Um, when I say distribute, I usually mean nodes that are connected over a network. So they're almost the same, except that when nodes are connected over a network, there's more cost in some sense to communication than um, if you have many nodes on a sort of uh, sharing some memory. Okay, so this type of Monte Carlo approach, this is known as important sampling or change of measure or so on. Um, this type of approach is very easy to parallelize or distribute, uh, so people are very happy. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't sort of solve every problem. There are many problems for which it's basically nearly impossible to come up with a good um, a good uh, importance distribution to the distribution for mu such that you know, the, the accuracy of your um, integral approximations or expectation approximations are reasonably small. Okay, so in those cases, at least in the absence of uh, concerns about parallelism or the ability to distribute the algorithm, people use things, uh, use more sophisticated methods which involve more sophisticated interactions between the random variables. So for example, SMC, or sequential Monte Carlo methods, they're kind of easy to parallelize and harder to, to distribute. Uh, and Markov chain Monte Carlo, so Leonardo just talked about uh, one, which actually is also parallel, because it's kind of like a parallel tempering scheme. MCMC is, at least in its basic form, non-trivial to parallelize or distribute, but there are versions of it, of course, that are quite parallel. Okay, and then of course, why do we care? Well, sometimes we care about because of the speed. You know, nowadays when you buy uh, sort of uh, workstation, it's going to have a CPU or a GPU in it which has many cores, doesn't have like one super, super fast core. Um, also concerns of energy efficiency, um, you know, taking advantage of, you know, the kind of architectures that are coming out today. We care about algorithms that are parallel and can be distributed for a variety of reasons. Okay, so here is a sequential Monte Carlo algorithm. Again, this is a very high-level talk, so it's not necessary to sort of, you know, uh, feel super happy with the particular notation that I've chosen or anything. 
Uh, but this is a very old algorithm, and it's used for approximating fairly arbitrary integrals, although I'm not going to get into you know, the exact class of integrals or expectations that you're able to approximate using this type of algorithm. The main thing that I want to focus on is sort of some of the features of the algorithm that you can look at just by looking at the sort of pseudocode. Okay. So the first step of the algorithm involves sampling a bunch of IID random variables. Well, there, we're, we're okay with that, right? That's fine in terms of uh, doing things in parallel. Um, in subsequent steps, it's kind of an iterative uh, it's kind of an iterative procedure, you basically sample a bunch of independent random variables from a particular distribution. So the sense that they're independent is fine for parallel uh, computation, um, but you can see that sort of the distribution of those, of those random variables at time p does depend on all of the previous, um, does depend on all of the random variables produced at time p minus one. So it's fine for parallel, uh, um, computation, but it's not so good for distributed computation because in a distributed context, you might have that these random variables actually reside on different machines. Okay. Uh, some people like to think of this as a kind of evolutionary algorithm with mutating particles. These M's are sort of Markov kernels, uh, which you can simulate from. Those M's correspond to uh, kind of mutations, and the G's, which are non-negative uh, functions, correspond to somehow selection probabilities. Uh, and this, again, is not necessarily super important. The important thing is that once after you run the algorithm, there are various quite simple things that you can compute which represent uh, um, almost surely convergent uh, approximations of expectations of interest. Okay. So as hopefully is kind of clear, it's fairly simple to parallelize certain aspects of SMC. Um, in particular, so I guess, you know, for, for, for the sake of being as precise as possible, basically, if you need to compute GP minus one on a bunch of different random variables, you can compute them all in parallel. If you want to mutate, if you've chosen a, th this is a kind of mixture distribution, and you can kind of think of XPI as being distributed according to an MP XP minus one of some ancestor of I, okay? And once you've chosen the ancestor, then you can imagine simulating from that in parallel for all the ancestors. So that's also quite trivial to parallelize. The bit that's sort of not easy to parallelize is picking the ancestor. Okay. Um, the selection interaction step, as I've said there, is trickier. I mean, we've looked at it. I think, I mean, it's not, a, it's not sort of big news for anyone. I think anyone who looks at the algorithm will notice that that's a trickier part of the algorithm, um, even in parallel, but you know, certainly m even more when you come to distributed sequential Monte Carlo techniques. So when it comes to distributed SMC, there are some people who have worked on some nice approaches. One of them is particularly elegant called the double bootstrap. And I won't get into the details, but basically it involves running an SMC algorithm where those mutations are themselves SMC algorithms. Okay? So, I mean, th th there's some nice math behind it, but you can actually make this M an SMC algorithm itself. Um, a second approach is to try and p uh, form a bridge. So this is with my collaborator, Nick Whiteley, and Carrie Hine for the first paper. Um, you kind of build a bridge between a more, uh, a much simpler type of Monte Carlo scheme, like important sampling, and, uh, and sequential Monte Carlo, which involves all of this interaction. The idea is that you can basically modulate this interaction using a, a potentially sparse matrix, um, where if you use a, a very dense matrix, then you actually recover this algorithm, and if you use, say, the identity matrix, which is pretty sparse, then you actually obtain uh, sequential important sampling, or important sampling. And the issue with important sampling, it's actually quite easy in some sense, although you know, it, it would require a substantial amount of notation to compare important sampling with SMC to make clear why we prefer SMC in some cases over important sampling. Basically, when you use important sampling, you end up with weighted particles where the weights become sort of uh, very, very variable as time, as time goes on or as you sort of incorporate more information. So it's nice to have a kind of bridge, and you can still kind of do um, some things to control the variability of the weights with this kind of uh, generalization of SMC, which we called alpha SMC for no specific reason except that we call the matrices alpha matrices. Okay. So those things are interesting, and you know, they're th like, you know, we have some follow-up papers on how you should choose the matrices in some sense, but it's still sort of an open problem in terms of looking at any way of doing things optimally because it's sort of so difficult to, uh, it's quite difficult to come up with good even objective functions for determining optimality. 
So the bit that maybe is even easier to understand, I mean, I like SMC and I work a lot on SMC, so it was worth mentioning it. It's also relevant for one of the things later. Something that many people are familiar with is, the, is using Markov chain Monte Carlo to approximate expectations, because this in particular has had a, uh, a massive impact on the practice of Bayesian statistics in particular, but you know, a lot of kind of data analysis. And also it's quite important in statistical physics. So the idea of Markov chain Monte Carlo very simply is you simulate a Markov chain x1, x2, and so on, which has uh, unique stationary distribution pi. And then you have a sort of law of large numbers for Markov chains, which says that under very weak conditions, which again, I won't bore you with the details of, uh, sort of the time averages or the ergodic averages converge almost surely to the expectation of interest. Um, and for at least one of the things I'm going to talk about later, or, and it's also useful to know that basically it's very easy to construct such a Markov chain. There are sort of generic ways of doing it. And one of the main uh, mechanisms for doing that is to use a metropolis Hastings chain. And these kind of Markov chains have a particular sort of form, which is, you know, useful to keep in mind, which is that if you're at, a, if you're at, if you've got x n and you want to simulate x n plus one conditional upon uh, x one up to x n, then you propose some y y n from some Markov kernel Q, um, and then you basically kind of accept or reject that value of y in the sense that you set x n plus one to be equal to yn with the probability that depends on xn and yn through some function alpha, and otherwise you kind of set xn plus one to be equal to xn. So you have a sort of Markov chain which sort of sometimes jumps and sometimes stays where it is. Okay. okay. But the main issue if you want to talk about sort of uh, parallelizing that simple algorithm is that well, at least from a naive perspective, you would say, well, Markov chains have a serial dependent structure. How am I going to parallelize something that basically depends on its, on its predecessor in this sort of very simple way? Um, there are many ways around it. Uh, so something that I don't talk about here are sort of, so one thing I should mention, there are ways to parallelize the simulation of a Markov chain when, for example, the transition kernel is very expensive, right? So for example, in parallel tempering approaches, you have a very big Markov chain and you can do lots of calculations in parallel. In some cases, if you're running uh, a Markov chain for a statistical problem, uh, usually computing this acceptance probability involves computing a posterior density. If computing the posterior density is very complicated but can take advantage of parallel computations, then you can use parallelism to help you there or distributed computing to help you there. The point of this talk is not to talk about those kind of aspects, it's to talk about parallel and distributed sort of general purpose algorithms. Okay, so one thing that of course you can do is you can run a bunch of independent chains in parallel and that works quite well for simple problems, uh, uh, but you know, it has some issues in terms of trading off bias and variance. Okay. Um, as I said here, oh yeah, I did mention it here, if you, what you, well something that you can do is you, know, you can evaluate alpha or simulate yn in parallel if the computation is somehow hard enough. Uh, there were some early works by Sohn and Brockwell called, uh, called prefetching. The idea is to sort of uh, um, perform a bunch of computations on the assumption that you would have, say, uh, rejected a lot of the proposals. So if you believe that you have a very high rejection probability, then you can basically simulate uh, lots of guys from QXN and then compute the alphas in parallel and then you basically have simulated in some sense the chain up to the first acceptance. Okay. Uh, so that's what Sohn considered, Brockwell considered sort of a little bit more, more variety in that you can construct a tree of, of length log n uh, if n is the number of processors that you have and do a sort of, you know, this kind of speculative computation. So that's fine, it works well if the rejection rate is high or you know how to build a good tree in terms of not wasting too much computational effort. Okay, so some of the things that I'm interested in doing in this context are, um, it's a bit related to parallel tempering, which of course is uh, sort of well established as one way to parallelize, but doesn't universally work well and has some less pleasing features in certain contexts. Um, one approach to parallel MCMC is to make computations harder in a general purpose way by simulating lots of proposals. So instead of simulating just one proposal and accepting it, one thing you can try and do is simulate lots of proposals and accept it, and, and accept one of them, right? Or you can use a, even an SMC algorithm to, to, to really tailor your proposals to the particular space that you're working on, 
And there are many interesting avenues that can be explored in terms of how you should design exactly a good SMC algorithm for that purpose. I mean, it's easy to do something clever. It's not easy to do something which you know somehow is optimal or close to optimal or really making a lot of sense. Um, and of course, you know, people will say, oh, if you simulate a bunch of proposals and you only accept one, that's a waste. Well, there's many procedures which you can consider in terms of not throwing away all of that computation. Some of them are called waste recycling uh, from the physics literature, but there are, you know, control variants and so on. Okay. Um, another thing that you can do is you can look at, uh, so that works for parallel MCMC. In terms of distributed MCMC, what you want to do is have ways to sort of break up the computation of simulating a long Markov chain. And one thing that you can do, which was already noticed uh, in Brockwell and Cadane and related to some, some, some contemporary work with that as well uh, by Meekland and co-authors, is that what you can try and do is identify regeneration times of the chain. Because if you can identify regeneration times of a Markov chain, then you can split a Markov chain into independent tours. So the idea, of, of course, for people who are not familiar, is that if you think of a discrete state space Markov chain, say, you know, on, on the integers that reaches zero with some probability, then every time the chain somehow reaches zero, it starts again from zero and completely has forgotten its past, right? So if you were, if you were to run a Markov chain, uh, well, if you were to run that Markov chain by just simulating many tours from zero back to zero, then you can reconstruct a very long Markov chain um, in essentially in a distributed sense. So for general state space Markov chains, it's a little bit more complicated because you usually don't have a Markov chain on a discrete state space. But nevertheless, certainly for Monte Carlo Markov chains, they are mo mainly regenerative and it becomes an issue of whether or not you can detect the regeneration times in a, in a practical way. And there are many ways to, to try and address that. And I think one of the best is this approach by Brockwell and Cadane, which we've also done recently a little bit of work on and shown that sort of it is promising and I think it's a very practical way to try and make progress on a, uh, for a variety of applications. Okay, so that's uh, all I wanted to talk about and I'm very happy to uh, take any questions or talk with people further about the things that they may or may not be interested in in this setting. Hi. Uh, I have two completely different questions, sorry. Okay. Uh, the first one is, is uh, has any of this been implemented? Could you actually get software that distributes uh, 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 MCMC computation on a giant uh, cluster? So we have, well, I mean, it's been implemented this kind of approach. I've also implemented it. I haven't implemented it in a general purpose way on a cluster, but I would like to. Okay. Right? In that, you know, what I need is someone with the skills uh, and time. In some sense, I also have the skills, but I don't necessarily have the time. Yeah. Right, thanks. And uh, the, the second question is, if you generated a lot of candidates mm -hmm. in parallel in, in, uh, you know, uh, in a Metropolis Hastings setting or something like that, mm -hmm. is there any, uh, I mean, have you thought about an intelligent way to combine them? Maybe a you know, linear or convex combination? Oh, you mean how to do the? Right, I mean, you, you were saying that you just, a lot of them end up being wasted. You select one of them. Oh, uh, yeah. So this, this waste recycling thing is actually pretty good. I mean, I don't think people know necessarily that how to do it optimally, but there are nice ways to combine all of them to, to, okay. to contribute towards, essentially, the estimate of the expectation. So instead of just using a simple ergodic average, you can use an ergodic average of a more complicated bunch of sums. And it, it's quite principled. It's not like made up. It's not a, it's not a sort of a heuristic or anything. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, actually, a similar question related to mm -hmm. the multi-tri metropolis. Can you recycle? Multiple tri metropolis? Yes, yes you when can. you recycle yeah. to a, you know, like all like the wasted yeah. rejection, yeah. Uh, can, can be done this like? Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's absolutely true that you can, you can waste recycle those guys to, right. to do it. I mean, I, you know, some people have not yet done it, but it's not that the theory isn't there. It's just right. practically. The connection between the people who know how to do it and the okay. people who, you know, have the patience to do it. Is and for the second point, like uh, the regeneration time, how hard is to find the regeneration time? So it's a tricky thing. So in this, in, in this paper, one of the interesting things is what it does is it involves introducing, in some sense, an artificial atom. So when I talked about sort of returning to zero, it kind of introduces um, at least one thing which is kind of like a zero that you can return to with positive probability. Um, when you have a general state space Markov chain, there are no 
sort of artificial, or there are, there are no singleton atoms like that, so you need to introduce them. How you introduce them becomes the design choice. So there are, there are a variety of ways. One way is to mix the original Markov, uh, uh, the, 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 the Markov kernel of the original Markov chain with another Markov kernel, which tries to like move between this artificial atom and the, general and, the, and the original state space. Another way is to sort of mix the proposals, but it's very similar. Um, tuning exactly how you should construct those proposals is non-trivial in that there's one major issue that occurs because of uh, not knowing, in most cases, the normalizing constant of the, of the density with which you're constructing your, your metropolis hastings chain. Um, but there are ways to try and get around that, and I think that this is really a sort of an avenue of research which uh, died out in around 2006, but should be picked up again because it's very interesting and very timely. And it wasn't for good reasons that it died out. It was just, you know, people were less interested in parallel and distributed uh, Markov chain simulation. 